What's up, Mission? How are we? Uh, Merry Christmas. So cool, so cool. I love this church. Uh, so if you're hanging out online or on the patio or in the lobby or in the room, welcome, welcome, welcome. I'll say it Merry Christmas as much as we can. We'll even say it into the new year. I'm like, when do you stop saying Happy New Year? Aren't we happy that the new year's coming at some point? Then we can just say we're getting ready for it. I don't know. So Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. Uh, my name is Mike Hickerson. I'm honored to be the lead pastor of Mission Church. I love this place. Man, the heart of generosity, those toys like Daly was talking about, that's an amazing pile of toys out there. Thank you so much for being being a generous church. We exist as a church to help people find and follow Jesus. That's what we go after together. So if you're just checking mission out for the weekend or you got drugged here, you thought you were going to brunch and you made like a little pit stop before they're going to pay for brunch for you, then welcome. This is a safe place to be on the journey. Uh, We just believe that God is who he says he is and will do everything that he promised to do. Like we hold together that there are no perfect people in this room or on this stage, and that's great news for the people that are next to us that know we're imperfect. It's not real great for you if you think you're perfect, right? Uh, but there are no perfect people, but there's a perfect God who rescues and saves. And we don't like power up on each other to remind each other of imperfections. It's not like, man, we take great joy in reminding each other how imperfect the others are. It's just a way for us as the church together to realize, man, without God in our lives, without the rescue that we've received as a much-loved son or daughter of the Most High God, then we are all sunk. And so it's helpful every now and then at the beginning of church together to just look at each other and be like, hey, I think he's talking about you right now. I think think you really need to hear this, that you are not perfect. So turn to the person next to you and just say, he's talking about you and you are not perfect. So go ahead and say that. They're going to say it back to you. It's okay. It's okay. Again, when you're in a real fight relationally, this is not the time to remind each other of imperfections because it can come across a little powerfully shaming. That's not what it is. But it's helpful as a church together to rem- remember that there's no one that's perfect, but that anyone is welcome. Anyone is invited. No matter who you are or where you've been or what you've been through, you are invited into the story of God. He's not bailed on you. He's not forgotten you. He's not a, a annoyed with you. He doesn't want to remove himself from you. He's actually literally moved heaven and earth so that you could be rescued and restored back to a much-loved son or daughter of his. And change is possible. We don't have to stay stuck in the same hurts or habits or hang-ups that we've been in. God has given us everything that we need to live the life that he's called us to. And that means that there's hope for everyone. In this season, I love Christmas so much. I'm a sucker for it. Um, but it's like this season of hope. No matter who you are or where you've been, and it's a reminder that God has sent Jesus into the mess to rescue and save. And that means that there's hope for every single one of us. But we in this, we're in this series where we say, why in the world? You know, and I'm, I'm a little, this is just letting you into my heart, which is a scary place sometimes, but I'm a little bit cynical. I'm a little bit antagonistic. Like I'm an eight on the Enneagram, which is aggressive, and it's called the challenger. I'm just like, I like to spar verbally. Jody and I will be sitting in a fire pit. We'll be talking about something, and we'll be getting into a very passionate discourse about said topic, and then she starts getting her feelings hurt, which I don't have any of those, so I don't know what's going on. And then she'll say, like, do you even care what we're talking about? And I was like, no, I could care less. I could care less. So I'm super fun at parties and really fun to be married to. Um, And so my daughters can tell you that. But why in the world? You know, like I ask these questions, like, why in the world are we doing this? Or why in the world is that happening? Or why in the world does somebody let this go on? Or who in the world is taking care of that? Or who is responsible? Like, so in this season, I think it's helpful in this series to say, like, why in the world? If it seems like sometimes the world is in a mess but there's hope for us, then why in the world did God send Jesus into it? And we've talked about last week, awesome message, like literally so, so good that why Jesus came into the world is one of the reasons is to fulfill the law. This whole like fat front part of our Bible that talks about how God was trying to restore and rescue a people and that there's some penalty for rebellion and sin and death, but humans could never make their way back towards God. So God sent Jesus into the mess to be the fulfillment of the law like, for all time, that we don't have to do the sacrificial system anymore, that God sent Jesus into the mess to be our sacrifice so that we could be made right with him. He came to fulfill the law and Jesus knew that. Awesome. Why in the world? Fulfill the law. Today, I get a fun one. Why in the world? To seek and save. And next week we're going to talk about why in the world did God send Jesus into it? To bless the world, to be a blessing. It got me thinking, like, that's kind of the the brand of Jesus. If we're going, like, that's why he came, that's what he's about. Like, that would be his tagline, for lack of a better term, you know? And then it got me thinking about, I, again, I'm a little cynical, and I like to laugh. So I found some, some, if brands were honest um, in our world, I found some things that were, like, not what they say, but what they do 
or how they make us feel. You with me on that? We'll, we'll just rock through a couple. You probably got a couple in your mind. Like Maybelline. Maybe it's Maybelline or maybe it's Photoshop. Like that's like if brands were honest, right? So Photoshop kids, I'm sorry. It was a thing where you would take a, think filters, but for old people. I'm sorry, 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 sorry. Hallmark, Hallmark. When you care enough to give a card mass produced by a corporation. So if brands were honest. If brands were honest, WebMD, convince yourself that you have a terminal illness. <laughs> it's, it's funny. It's never good news on WebMD. That could be the other one. That could be the other if brands were honest. Lego. Here we go. The bane of your foot's existence. Lego. Right there. Ikea. We throw in extra parts to mess with you. I got one that I, that I hope I can, if, just don't write me any emails, all right? It might, it's not on the screen. It's just the one, like Motel 6, we keep the light on for you because we're probably in a sketchy neighborhood. <laughs> so if, if brands are honest, it's stuff like that, right? Because what, what, how they do, what they do and what, what they say and how they do it or how they make us feel, it sometimes doesn't add all the way up, right? You with me? And it's funny, we're having fun. But then I got me thinking, like, like what if... What if our lives were honest? Like the story of, I don't want to say brand, but the, or the brand of our lives, or like if people were looking our lives, like what we say versus what we're really about or how we make other people feel. What would be the story of our lives if our lives were honest? Because why in the world Jesus came is you start watching like the story or the honesty or the brand of his life, if it was honest, it is all about seeking and saving. There are two different times that Jesus says, actually, like, I have come to, and like, like I'll tell you what the two are. One is in John 10, 10, it's not in the screen, on the screen, but it's a pretty like, famous verse. It says, the enemy of our souls is a thief and comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But John 10, 10 says, Jesus says, I have come to give you life and life to the full. That's one of the brands of Jesus, if he was honest. And the second one is what we're going to walk through today. It's in Luke 19, 10, or 1 through 10. It's an amazing story of, it's a pretty famous interaction of Jesus uh, walking into Jericho, and there's a, a this guy named Zacchaeus that's a tax collector there, and we find out kind of, kind of why, why Jesus came, why in the world Jesus came through this interaction. So it'll be on the screen, it'll be on your Bible portion of your notes, so you can follow in the message notes, or uh, let's just jump in together. Luke 19, 1 through 10 says it this way, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. So like it's not an IRS thing. We've talked a little bit about this in, at Mission before, but if you don't understand the context, it can kind of get you mess, messed, up, messed up a little bit. So in tax, like Zacchaeus would have been hated because they were occupied by Rome at the time. And so Rome would have like a flat tax that they would pay everybody that they were occupied by. But a tax collector could buy their way into position and then they could charge on top of whatever Rome would collect, they could charge whatever they wanted and they would keep all the money. So they were viewed as like somebody that was a traitor to the the Roman Empire, but they also were viewed as somebody that was like taking advantage of their friends and their family and their neighborhood and profiting off of the, the occupation that they had, right? So it's not that they just worked for the IRS and were really good with numbers. That's not why people hated them. It's because they aligned themselves with the enemy in their minds and were profiting off of it. And Zacchaeus would have been like the most hated because he was a chief tax collector. Like he had people on people on people that were doing this for him. So all that money on a pyramid scheme, it's not a pyramid scheme. It just looked like this. I'm just kidding. Uh, but all that money from the pyramid scheme was rolling up to him. So he was despised and hated. In fact, um, I'm going to take us back a little bit to this interaction of like kids church on this interaction. And so if you ever had a felt board, I didn't grow up in church, but I even know this song because I've been in kids church ministry enough to know this song. Like, and so if you know it, I'm going to need some help to sing along with me. And if you don't know it, you're going to be like, what just happened? This is so weird. So that's what's getting ready to happen, right? Because so Zacchaeus was a wee little man and a wee little man was he. So he climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to and when the Savior passed his way he looked up in that tree and said but you got to say it like a fourth grade or a third grade boy when they're yelling it like Zacchaeus you come down 
from going to your house today, from going to your house today. Okay, if you don't know that song at all, you're like, this is the weirdest place I've ever been to in my entire life. But that's the, that's the interaction that's getting ready to go down. So we got this chief's tax collector right here, and, he, and Jesus is walking by, and he is despised. Like, everyone hates this guy, and everyone knows who he is, right? Like, they don't want anything to do with him. But he wanted to see who Jesus was. But because he was short, vertically challenged, it's okay, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed up on a sycamore fig tree to see him since he was coming that way. And when Jesus reached that spot, he looked down to him, or looked up to him and said, Zacchaeus, which I think is amazing right here. So let me just say, so we got this scene. Jesus is a big deal. He's rising in popularity. He's coming through Jericho. All the people are lining the streets. It's like a huge parade. He's coming down. He's just passing through. Zacchaeus gets up in a tree, hoping not to be seen because he's just trying to hide out to get a look at who Jesus is. And all of a sudden the whole thing stops and Jesus says his name and the whole crowd turns and they're like, oh sweet, this is going to be awesome because Jesus is going to tell Zacchaeus what's up in this moment. He's going to tell him off. He's going to tell him to stop being a traitor. He's going to stop taking advantage. Everyone hates this dude. Oh, Jesus is going to kill this guy. It's going to be awesome to watch. And he looks at him and says, no, 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 Zacchaeus, I need you to come down immediately. And Zacchaeus, you know, feeling the heat, the heat raising through his body. His face is probably turning red. He doesn't know what's coming. He's already embarrassed enough that he has to get up in the tree. Everybody despises him and hates him and talks about him behind his back anyway. And Zacchaeus is coming down because Jesus is calling him out publicly. And then he says, I must stay at your house today. And this would have wigged everyone out. Because like religious clean people don't hang out with like traitor, tax collector, sinful people. And everyone knows that. And for sure you don't eat meals. It's like, you know, meals in the first century were like junior high, you know, like you only ate with your crew and how dare anybody cross the line at the lunch table. Like it mattered who you ate with back in the day. So no one, it would be like going to hang out at uh, like, uh, like the tax collector's house, except for Jesus. So he came down at once, the verse goes on, and welcomed him gladly, and all the people saw this and began to mutter, he is gone to be the guest of a sinner. And just stop for just a second. You got any mutterers around you? Like, we can talk a lot of things. But like, you, you're working on like maybe surrendering to God to make some changes, or you're trying to figure out this faith thing, or you don't have all the questions answered, and you don't know all that you're supposed to know, or all that you're supposed to do. You're trying to hang around, you're trying to make some new hurts, or some new habits, and some new patterns with your life, trying to get out of some of the old stuff that's got you stuck in where you are, and then you, like you start making steps, and you're trying to do some things, and then you feel like a group of well-meaning, or maybe not so well-meaning, or righteous people, or maybe people that think they're better than you, or sometimes maybe even Christians start muttering about you, in your past but you're just trying to get to Jesus let's go on it's got I'm going to your house today and he's going to be the guest of a sinner you need to know that Jesus does not care about the mutters at all in your life he would say because you matter to him that you are restored back to your rightful place as a much loved son or daughter of the most high God. So you may have ears that hear the mutters, but Jesus doesn't care about the mutters because you matter. And you know, like when you're like brand is honest, like Jesus, or your life is honest, is what you talk about and what you say is actually what you do and how you live. And he's proven to be that, and that's who exactly who Jesus is. You start reading like the, the New Testament, the four biographies of Jesus, the four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that start the New Testament when Jesus shows up on the scene, and like people just liked being around him. Like he broke all kinds of barriers. People that were nothing like him liked being around him. Like uh, little kids wanted to hang out with him. Women felt esteem with him. Outcasts were welcomed by him. Pe people were hurting, found comfort with him. People who were considered notorious sinners wanted to eat with him. And he seemed to like being around them too. And no one was so unclean that he couldn't be seen with them. Like Jesus just has this 
way. And the good news wasn't that just someone could be accepted or saved or forgiven or redeemed or restored. The good news of Jesus showing up in this story and in our story is that anyone can. Anyone can be restored. And anyone can be forgiven. So Zacchaeus comes down. He stood up and he said to the Lord, and so they have this interaction. Look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. So what's going on here is that he has totally manipulated his whole community to get rich, but he's going by two things. There's an Old Testament restoration law that he's paying back four times what he stole or what he swindled out of somebody. So he's doing the Old Testament thing to make it right with his people, but he's also doing like a law of love thing is that I'm going to go above and beyond, and I'm going to be absolutely generous. I'll give half of my wealth away right now. I'll pay back four times the amount. Because a changed life, a changed heart can change a life. And we're talking like if Zacchaeus is in recovery, and like he's immediately got, like he's got a higher power right there, Lord, and he's also skipped to steps eight and nine. Like he's just making amends and making restitution as best as he can in that moment. Jesus said to him, today, Zacchaeus, today, salvation has come to this house. Because this man too is a son of Abraham, or like this man too is a rescued son of the Most High God. For the Son of Man, that's Jesus came to seek and save the lost. You never need to get it twisted with why Jesus came. You can't take the words out of his own mouth. I came to seek and save the lost. Jesus' mission is to seek and save the lost. For those that they thought, that for those that thought they could never get in, they can get in with him. For those that are drowning and need to find air, for those that are lost and need to be found, for those that are stuck and need to be free, for those that are dead in their sin, they can become alive. That's what Jesus is going, I have come to seek and save people exactly like that and exactly like you. Directionless, hopeless, wandering, aimless, empty, screwed up, on the outside, messy, lost, on the inside, messy, lost, down and out, up and out, left and out, right and out, center and out, wherever you are, seek and save the lost. If you were to write it all out, all the finances, the family stuff, the affair, the bad decisions, the addiction, the depression, the reputation, God would not have sent a self-help book to help you feel better and get better and five tools to maybe get out of your own ditch. He sent us a who, a savior, because well, we were in need of a savior. And this who that he sent is Jesus, and that who has a great why of why he came, and it is to seek and save the lost people like us. He specializes in that. That's what we go after. That's what Jesus is for us. And that's why he came. Why in the world did Jesus come to this mess? To seek and save the lost. So what we can learn, just a few things that we can learn, is that we got to do whatever it takes to get to Jesus. Just like the lessons from Zacchaeus I think would be helpful for us to know, right? Like I don't know like what barriers that you may be born with or born into with your life, right? Zacchaeus was vertically challenged, right? But, but he, w- he was going to do, and he was ostracized by his community, and he was kicked out. Like he wasn't allowed to be in temple. He wasn't allowed to be in church. He wasn't allowed to be around. Everyone hated being around him. But he was determined to do whatever he could do to get around Jesus, do whatever it takes to get to Jesus. I wouldn't know what barriers you got, what rebellion you got, what sin you got, what stuff you got, what history you got, what embarrassment you got. Do whatever it takes to get to Jesus. Because he is kind and good and for you. Second one, things that we can learn from Zacchaeus' story is that Jesus knows you. Like he called him by name. I love that. And I know that we're hiding out. We're like trying to hide out in our own sycamore trees of life or back rows or online or in patio or lobby or just hiding out. But Jesus knows you, man. He knows your name. He knows where you've been. He knows your biggest dreams. He knows your biggest struggles. He knows your biggest regrets your biggest hopes. And he's not trying to create more distance from you as much as you're trying to create it from him. He, Jesus knows you, Zacchaeus, come down. 
Come out of hiding. You're trying to get to me. I'm not trying to be difficult to get to. I know you. Jesus knows you and it's personal to him about you. He's for you and not against you. Third, I think it's helpful what we can learn is that when Jesus asks something of you, do it. Zacchaeus, come down. All right. I don't know why. I'm coming down. I'm going to your house today. Okay. I'm like, if I did that to you today, you'd be like, you're not coming over. We haven't cleaned the house. We don't have food. Like, how weird would it be if I was like, no, I'm, I just decided I'm just trying to be Jesus in your life right now. I'm just coming to your house today. Like, I'm not, don't worry, I'm not doing that. I'm not do, don't do that to me either. Please, please, please. <laughs> but when Jesus asks something in our lives, do it. Watch what happens on the other side of obedience. Fourth thing I think we can learn is, man, don't listen to the noise. The doubters out there that don't think that your changed life has any substance to it because they've watched you go down this road before. Don't listen to the noise of the people that hold your past against you. Because if we believe what we believe about Jesus, then our past has no power over us anymore. But the mutterers do when our ears are up. Don't listen to the noise of the mutterers because you matter to the one that matters most. Fifth thing I think we can learn is that if you've done wrong, you make it right as best as you can. As far as it depends on you. Where you've hurt people, where you've robbed people, where you've stolen, where you've withheld, emotionally, financially, relationally, like as far as it depends on you, like a changed life leads to life change. Like when we get close to Jesus, we start living like Jesus. And if we've done wrong as far as we can, and we can't always make it all right, we can't. But as much as we can, as best as we can, as far as it depends on us, let's make it right and live at peace. Man, I wouldn't pretend to know your story this Christmas. Wouldn't pretend to know the journey that you're walking through. But I do know that Zacchaeus was thinking that he was just doing whatever it took so that he could see Jesus. But Jesus knew exactly why he was walking through Jericho to have a conversation with somebody who did not think that they were in, as excluded from everyone, to say, you know what, I came. I came to this planet. I came to be sacrificed. I came to rescue and save. I came to seek and save people like you. You, Zacchaeus, and people like you, Mike, people like you, Tony, people like you, Andrea, right? It's personal to Jesus about you. Why in the world? Because of people like you and me that need to be found and restored. And we can't do it on our own. Why don't you pray with me? God, you are good, and you're great, and you rescue and heal, and we're grateful. God, we love you. We're really grateful for your word that just gives us so much insight into who Jesus is and who you are as a father and your heart for people that are on the outside and struggling. So God, let us find hope in that, that you're good and kind. Let us find hope and purpose in that, that we are called to live that way as well. In Jesus' name we pray.